Jennifer Abrams is a former high school English teacher who has become a communications consultant and author. Jennifer works with a multitude of people to develop effective communication skills and has written numerous publications, including the powerful book, Having Hard Conversations. Jennifer has been invited to keynote, facilitate and coach at schools and conferences worldwide, and has been named as one of the 18 women that all K-12 educators should know by the Finding Common Ground blog. So welcome to the show, Jennifer, and let's get right at it. What do you define as a hard conversation? Hard conversations are anything that the person that is trying to find their voice around what matters finds challenging. So it could be that it's difficult to express a concern to uh, a colleague about something maybe interpersonal. It could be something that a supervisor is seeing in a classroom um, that is sort of a gap in somebody's uh, skill set, and they're trying to maybe give some feedback on that. It could be that you need to have a hard conversation with a parent because something is not per se going well with their child in the classroom. It could be hmm, talking to a whole team about something that the school is moving forward and it's not moving forward as well as they'd want. So it's something that's maybe uncomfortable to say, but somebody has got to speak up around what matters. And so that's why I thought the book would, would be helpful for a variety of people. Yeah, th thanks for that. Thanks for clarifying. I I'm really, really intrigued, Jennifer, on, on what happened. What's the impact when we don't have these conversations, when we don't speak up? Mm. Well, uh, personally, you are not living by your principles. You're letting things go by that aren't um, what you are hoping in the it to 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 be living in like it's just it lets things happen the other person has the power they continue to do whatever they're doing uh you haven't lived by your principles and then i think it also depends in in the united states we tenure people okay so that means that in certain certain states that we have here when you get tenured you have the right to teach for for a long time and if you don't have those hard conversations people can continue to perpetuate negative behaviors or continue to just do stuff for a long time and so we need to speak up when things happen because you could by not saying something have that be the practice that person has over time and it could affect uh students for decades there's a, there's a there's a link there isn't there jennifer with sort of self-worth of your own sort of boundaries or limitations or values and, and i'm just wondering um when you ask yourself that question you know is this something that's that i should be having a conversation around mm -hmm. are you very much focused as you as you start to consider that um conversation are you very much focused on what you want the outcome to be or, or should you be more focused on what the process is of, of actually having that and starting that conversation in earnest? Hmm. I would say in the work that I do, I sort of uh, have sort of some self-talk in several ways. First off, do I want to have the conversation at all? And the, the question I, I, I say to the, at the very beginning is, was or is this educationally unsound? Is it physically unsafe? or is it emotionally damaging to students or to staff? And that's that if I say, you know what, that it, it is, it's not following whatever we decided was the protocol for the way we're gonna teach, or it's not safe for children, or it really doesn't allow a, a psychologically safe environment and it was emotionally damaging. Then I go, you know what, I think I might need to speak up. Then I ask other questions. What's um, when should I do it? Should I be the one who'll do it? What will happen if it's it, it goes poorly? Um, is this really just something that I have a pet peeve about or is this really a challenge? And there are many questions I ask that are sort of like speed bumps that stop me from just you know exploding. But then I ask the question, two questions. If I say something, can I say it in a professional way? And then what's my action plan for that? So if the person says, well, what do you want me to do about it? Do I know that? And so in the workshops that I do, I kind of guide people through 
exercises that move them on this path. So when you said, should it be about the outcome or should it be about the process? I wish I could tell you, I would say the answer is yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, what do we want to see instead of what we're seeing? What's the different outcome that we'd like to see? Absolutely. But then what's the process of them getting there? And what are you going to tell them? And that's a whole other question. So yeah, there's, there's yeah. a lot to it. We don't give this enough time. Yeah. You know, people are like, just tell me, tell me what to say. And I'm like, let's back up. Yeah. <laughs> now let's back up. What's the real problem? Have yeah. you thought about it professionally? Is it attached to professional standards? And they're like, oh, and then they get angry at me. This is a lot of me having to do a lot of planning when they change. And I said, yes. And then I just sort of leave it there, right? You know, it, yeah, they yeah. Should, you know, they should change, but you better say something in a humane way so that they get it and then they can change. So, so it's having an outcome maybe in mind, but really, really respecting the process as you go along. And, and I, one of the, I really liked that idea there that you asked yourself three questions about, is it in, a, in an education context? Is it educationally unsound? Is it physically unsafe or is it emotionally damaging? Are there almost sort of your qualification questions yes. then before yeah. you sort of drive your car down the street and you hit the speed bumps? Tell us a little bit more about the speed bumps, the ways that you sort of check okay. in with yourself. So if if you've decided that it really doesn't match up, like it's really emotionally damaging, it's causing uh, tension in a team or it's really, we just, you know, you're supposed to teach two plus two is four and somebody's teaching two plus two is nine. Now we have to have a conversation. So then that's like stop sign. Great. Now we're moving forward. So if we're going to move forward in chapter three of one of my books on having hard conversations, I say, here are some questions you need to consider. And I, I, I got all these questions from people like you, teachers all over the world. And I placed them into subcategories of factors to consider before you speak up. And one is timing. One is the stakes if you don't speak up. One is um, personal association. One is doability. Like is what you're gonna ultimately ask the other person doable? Um, and I think I have seven categories. And if I turn around, I could, <laughs> I could go grab the book. But it's, there's not, there's no chronology. Like you think about the timing first and then you think about this. It's just all of these things. And I don't know who you are. So if Lewis, let's say Lewis is one of those ready fire people, let's slow down a minute. Let's think about the timing of this. Maybe you don't want to say it right now. But if Alan is like, I already think about the timing, I need to think about the stakes or the doability. So I have, I ask people to kind of assess themselves and stop themselves with speed bumps because chances are they haven't done enough thinking. They just know this is a problem and they should say something. But now I kind of complexify that and I say, well, let's, let's think about that. But the two questions I mentioned to you guys before, do I know what the problem is? Can I say it in a humane way? And then do I have an action plan thought out? Cause if the person says, okay, fair enough. What do you want me to do instead? Mm. And I go, I have no idea. You just shouldn't do what you've been doing. That ends up not being <laughs> Of course. And you know what? You know what? This is one of those moments, now that I laugh, where my research pays off a little bit here because I've got your seven steps written down. And I'm going to read them out. And, and I understand now that this is non-linear. It isn't a case of maybe going through these one by one and spending the same amount of time on each. It's actually choosing the ones that you feel you need to think about a little bit more. Um, and and I'll, reel, I'll reel them off quite quickly. What would be quite... Um, beneficial here, I think, Jennifer, is maybe just picking up on one or two and, and giving us some examples of the things to consider. So we've got timing, as you mentioned. What's at stake is another step, isn't it? Another mm -hmm. speed bump. Um, what are the chances of success, which I think is a brilliant one and probably stops the vast majority of us from ever having a difficult conversation. Um, what are the options that you've got? And you just talked about that with, do you have a sort of action plan or, or some sort of solution focus? Um, the sort of chances of failure, what if I fail, which is probably another massive barrier um, for us to have those conversations, the personal perspectives on it, you know, what does the other person, what's their lens on this and how do they see it? And that'll be formed in a, a myriad of different ways, won't it? And then the doability, um, yeah. is it actually something that you can do? Yeah, I, the option one was interesting for me in that is, is this 
better heard from somebody else in the sense of, should it be me that actually has this conversation? And for some of the, and for many of the things, the answer is yes. And people want to go, no, 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 maybe it shouldn't be me. I'll just, I'll tell the principal to have this conversation. But I often wonder in an option of like, is there somebody better that might be able to do it? So give me an example, um, a department head, um, a male uh, was, had a new female teacher and we didn't have a dress code, let's just say, for the for the faculty. And her, she was a, it was a senior teacher, so she was or a senior high teacher, so she had sixteen year olds and eight seventeen year old boys and eighteen year old boys. And it was, uh, uh, her, her dress code was a bit, you know, distracting, shall we say, to, to the boys. Uh -huh. um, and um, had the male department head gone and spoken to her about her cleavage showing it might have been taken as a sexual harassment blah 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 so he yet it's still distracting to the boys and do we want to focus on the the teaching of english literature or the outfit of the teacher okay so he came to me and he said this is not my hard conversation to have it's your conversation you are a coach and you are a female and we don't have a dress code. So there isn't per se anything in the professional behaviors and standards that she has violated. And yet there's a perception that it, it, it's getting in the way of her being effective, right? So maybe it's her turn. So that option was, is am I really the right person to do it? And so I, I had the conversation and I'll be darned, she's not working for our school district anymore, but she's still an English teacher, you know, so she's still teaching, but boy, would that have not been the right call for him to do it. So that's just like, who should be having this conversation and could be, could be influential. Just giving you an example. And yeah, that, yeah. Would, that would come under that sort of options area. Right. Yeah, to me, who's the better person yeah. to to do this? Um, is this something? And then I also have in that section, and I just do it just to be provocative. Is this better done in person, face to face, or could you send an email about this? And we know the answer to that one, don't we? <laughs> no, the answer is don't send an email, right? But I wanted to pose that. Um, and I also might want to say, is this something that should be shared with everybody or is this something that you should be doing with that one person? Because I know people um, throw out like one of those, you know, how like you go to the front office and in your little cubby or your, where you have your like your your mail, they I, I remember getting like just a reminder about blah, blah, blah. And you're like, who's this really about? Is this reminder for all of us or was it somebody who was a wimp and didn't have the hard conversation with the person they should have had? <laughs> and now all of us get this in, in our main, in our box. And I'm like, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know? So there are questions about like, is this really an, a one-on-one -on -one thing? Should this be an overarching thing? You know, there are lots of questions to ask yourself before you have a hard conversation. It's, it um, comes back to what Lewis says as well there about that nothing's linear here. It's very, very oh. contextual. It's and it's very contextual. It's very specific. And there is a linear way, at least in the work I do, that says everybody should think about the questions. Everybody yeah. should think about the outcome map. Everybody should think about a script. So there are like parts that Lewis and Alan and Jennifer need to do. And then it, it diverges from there could you tell us what your views are on 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 trust then and relationships around this is is it better i've had this conversation before Anna lewis with a guest previously is it better to have a hard conversation where you've built up a very good professional relationship and you've got trust or is it better where you maybe you haven't got that because you might find it a bit easier i don't know what, what's your views yeah. on that i it <sighs> I think it's certainly better if if we have built trust, we have a professional understanding of how we should all sort of be together um, and we're going to talk to each other. And this is this is how we roll. But along with that trust, I also say and it's not in the first book and I've been really thinking about this 
So it, it, regardless of trust, is there a clarifying sense of what we're all supposed to be doing? Have you had the clarifying conversation? Is this what is expected? And that's the stuff that you have trust, you don't have trust, that's fine. So for example, I'm just giving, I was just on a plane, okay? So I was on a plane coming back from Atlanta, Georgia. If the two pilots have the co-pilot and the, the, the first, first, what our first officer have worked together, fantastic, right? But if they haven't, there still is an expectation of how people are supposed to be. That's because it's already been set. This is the protocol. This is how I am in this. That's the kind of stuff that I wonder if that's happened enough. Okay. So let me give you an example. Um, This, this happened in one of the schools that I was working with. They are supposed to be working within a school that has a quote, culture of excellence. So now we're gonna have hard conversations with people who are not stepping up and living at the level of excellence. Now, if I said that to you, Lewis, and I hold, I hold you accountable to that, what might be your question to me? Well, what does excellence look like? Yeah. And if you haven't, like- right. But if you haven't ever clarified that, you cannot have a really legitimate hard conversation about that. And that happens all the time. It happens that somebody three years ago had a conversation and now 50% of the faculty has changed and they have no idea what you're talking about. There are people who, who assume that the concept of professionalism is clear with everybody and then they're angry about specific stuff and you're like, well, I didn't think about that. So if you haven't had a clarifying conversation or things have not been set, that to me is harder. So it'd be great if there was trust in a personal relationship, but what it would really help is if I actually had a clue about (laughs) what I was supposed to do, and then you can hold me accountable to it. So I say you have to have a clarifying conversation before you have a hard conversation. And many people go, oh, I never, you're right, I never made that clear. I'm angry about something I was never cleared with this person about. And I say, then that's not fair. And there's often, there's often disagreement before you're clear of of what those words mean. And we, you know, Alan and I mentioned a book in almost every episode called The (laughs) The Tyranny of Words by Stuart Chase. And Alan does his thing where he grabs it and shows it to the screen. (laughs) There you go. Right. I'm I'm, going to look at it right now. I'm I'm going to buy it. It's a phenomenal book. And essentially words matter. And the, the, the meaning behind words matter. Yeah, you know, we're teachers. We know from the science of learning. We know from cognitive science that um, as we sense things around us, as we attend to that information and as we process that through our working memory, we make decisions based on preconceptions and misconceptions of concepts and schemas that we've already got, right? Mm-hmm. So you're walking in, let, let's say you've had the clarifying conversation, Jennifer, and you're walking in for a conversation with somebody who has a very, very different idea of, of what the concept is that you're talking about to what they are. Do you then start to really unpick what, what, that, what that is and do some more clarifying? Does that build the trust? Or actually, is it now the time to start saying, listen, we're way off here. We, we, we're, not, we're not aligned in our thinking at all. And that needs to be the first thing that we keep working at. Yeah, that needs to be the first thing. And if you are, for example, the supervisor, then that needs to be, we need to get on the same page with what the school has decided. And if that person is like, well, I completely disagree and they don't believe in it, then that's a conversation about maybe this isn't the right place for you, Mm -hmm. but this is how we're supposed to roll. Do you see what I'm saying? If it's two of you and you are talking about what collaboration should look like. And um, this is, you know, and it's, and you're both of the same level, right? And you're just in teams. Then we have to have some deeper conversations about how, what would be helpful to me and what would be helpful to you. And maybe I'll meet some of those needs in collaboration. Maybe I won't, but to me, there, there should have already been an understanding of how we're supposed to collaborate together. It's, um, I think a lot about, I, there's a quote that I have in one of my books, the, 
what is it? Almost all conflict is the result of violated expectations. But the expectations sometimes are just in your head. They're mm -hmm. not written down. They've never been discussed. It's exactly what you said, Lewis, of these are just things that we think this is just how people should be. And when you're in an international school, as you are, um, and, you've, and you went to um, secondary school in, in the UK, and so you have an idea of how kids or teachers are supposed to be, how students are supposed to be, what curriculum is supposed to be. And then an American, a U.S. citizen like me comes in, totally different upbringing, completely different idea of how we should be teaching. We're going to clash until we have the conversation or the school says, nope, nope, we're doing it this way. <laughs> And you now have to kind of change up and work within this system, regardless of where you came from. Yeah. And that is, is a conversation at international schools that I think the IB, International Baccalaureate, maybe change, you know, allows for a common um, kind of work. But boy, oh boy, I'm working in schools all over the world. And between cultural disagreements or um, clashes, shall I say, um, between misunderstandings of just shouldn't schools be all like this, it, you get stuck. And so should it be a hard conversation at that point that you're frustrated and angry or should you just back up the truck, beep, 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 and go, let's <laughs> just go back, let's go back. Maybe we have misunderstandings here. Yeah. And I'm frustrated, but I was never clear. And, and yeah. you, you made a really interesting point there uh, just a little bit earlier on. You brought in that sort of third person into this conversation, which is the school. What, yes. what, does, what does the school want? Now, as soon as that happens, I imagine that the, the conversation becomes much less personal, much yes. much less sort of uh, A-type. I know from some of the work that you do, the A-type and the C-type conversations. Can you tell yes. us a little bit about that and what that, why, yeah. why that's so important? Um, I'm so impressed that you've read and know about this. I'm so I'm like, not everybody that I talk to has studied any of this. Cognitive conflict is where I think we should be trying to go. And I talk about that is that it's intellectual friction. It's cognitive discussion where we might have disagreements and tension, but we're not personalizing it. I'm not saying, and I'm noticing that both of you gentlemen have beards and I'm going to go, well, men with beards, you know, and I make it affective like conflict where I, I'm angry at you and I personalize it. And, you know, well, people, all people from the UK, you know, and, and it has nothing to do with where you're from or how you look or, but people make it that way. Sometimes when they just, when they just want to dig at you. They just want to make you feel uncomfortable because they don't have a cognitive intellectual argument. And I think that that we make fun. We oh those whiny elementary school teachers or those, those totally emotional English teachers or whatever. And you start to judge the person as opposed to having the conversation. And that happens too often. And for me, there was a president of my country prior to this one who did that, who did that. And so I don't want people to do that. It was painful. It was painful. And people need to just sort of have a much more intellectual conversation. And that's where, that's where I'm hoping we can go. Let's fast forward. You, you've gone through all these speed books. You've, you've looked at your seven areas. You've, you've, mm -hmm. you've thought about them and you're thinking, yes, I still want to have this conversation. Can you Good. tell us a little bit about the responses that you might get? And I know this is a big part of your workshops as well, but what, what are the responses that you might get? Do you plan for specific responses? Do you, do you give yeah. that your, your bandwidth? I think First, okay, so first off, I say, let's not worry about what the other person's going to say yet. But I do in the second book, Hard Conversations Unpack, what if they say this, what if they say that? I want to step back and say, we need to make sure we're saying what we think is the right thing. So I say, back up, not, let's not think about them yet. Let's think, have we, have we determined 
how to say what we want to say in a professional, humane way. Have we thought through why the other person might not be doing this thing yet, whatever we're thinking? And then are there ways, are there places that we would like to suggest they could go in a, to, to do it differently and provide them some supports? So we're still on our side of the net. We're still thinking about what we need to do. And as long as you then say, you know what? I've been professional, I'm humane, I'm growth producing, I'm thinking of things that, that I wanna see, I've thought about doability, all that stuff, that's on my side. Then I feel pretty good that I'm certainly not exacerbating the problem. I've been clear, I've been as thoughtful as I possibly can. So that's my like three quarters of what I wanna do is we work on you. Most people though go, but I'm so anxious they're gonna yell at me, but I'm so anxious they're gonna say this to me, but I'm so, and I go, okay, now we can think about what might come up. So what might they say when you do this? And I have people anticipate what they're going to say. And I've actually worked with administrators who've said, I know they're going to say this. Here's what I'm thinking I'm going to say back. Then they're going to say this. And here's what I'm going to say back. And I work with them on those responses. In Hard Conversations Unpacked, I have a whole chapter on what if they yell at me? What if they go personal on me? What if they say you never blah, blah, blah? What if they say you're not treating me like a professional? What if they say, and I have all of these possible answers. And I've shared that I was in Brazil and I shared the, the answers in a school that I was working with. And a Brazilian woman said, you would never say this in Brazil. You could never do that. And I said, ah, so you're suggesting that you have to be mindful of culture, that you have to be mindful of, of status. And she goes, yes, you would absolutely need to do this. So whatever I give you, you still have to contextualize. You still have to decide on the style. But what I want to always offer to people is these are normal responses by people who are feeling defensive. And maybe you could prepare to say these things back so that you don't get swept because people will yell and people will cry. And I don't want everybody to, because nobody else has been in the workshop, just you. <laughs> so, the <laughs> other person, so the other person is like losing it. And um, I don't want you to. So I want you to stay strong. So I offer those ideas. Yeah, there's some lovely little takeaways there. I'm I'm really interested, Jennifer, in your scripting. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure Lewis and I, we've both had these conversations and it's always worked better when we've scripted it out. Our listeners would love some ideas from you on how we could script. Okay, so I do a foundational six pieces and in the book, I have samples. I never call them exemplars, okay? Because- I just don't. So you have to start with an indication of respect. So it could be, uh, Alan, um, knowing that I'd like to work effective, effectively with you as we conclude the year, I want to share something with you. But at least it's, and it might not be very like, you're wonderful, Alan. And I call this sort of like the <laughs> kind of thing. You don't, like, you don't have to like butter somebody up, but you do have to say, you know, I, I want to be, I want to be able to be in the present with you and something has been distracting me that you said. And so it's my intention to try to clear the air. You have to say something, right? So that it's positive it, intent. Is positive that what you're saying? Then you, then the second thing is you name the issue, whatever you want to talk about. And you do it in a way that aligns it with professional behavior. So you can't say you're a train wreck of a teacher. That's not, <laughs> it's nothing like that in the standards, right? You're a drama queen. You're a pain in the butt to work with. These are not helpful things. These are, you have to be professional in stating it. And that's what I really always like. You want to check with somebody before you go in. Does this, does this seem like a reasonable thing we could have a conversation about? Then the person, the third piece out of six, they're going to want to know what exactly they did or said that brought this conversation to the, to, head, to the head. And you want to share that with as much fact as you possibly can. 
So I would suggest no more than three examples. What did they say? What did they do? What did they not do? What did they not say? Um, that brought us to this conversation. I have people that want to presume intent and motivation. So if Lewis and I agreed that Lewis was going to call me last night and I didn't receive a call, the fact is I didn't get a call. But I'm so angry at Lewis because of A, B, C, and D that I go, you deliberately chose to ignore me and you blew me off yesterday. You know, And we don't know that he deliberately chose anything. He might not have ignored me. His phone might have lost battery power. Do you see what I mean? But I add all this stuff. That's not fair. I want you to stay as clean and as crisp as you possibly can. And I would choose no more than three. Okay. I have people that say, but I've been collecting data on this person since last September. And I have like nine things I'm really angry about. <laughs> and I say, well, too bad because they're going to say, well, why didn't you talk to me six months ago? You know, and then they're going to distract you with the fact that your timing was bad. So that I wouldn't do. The fourth thing I would say is what I call the, so what? So Lewis didn't call me yesterday. So Alan, Alan's students were sleeping and doing English in the PE class and whatever. So what, what's the point? You need to describe why this is an important, hard conversation to have. What's the impact on the kids or what, what was the impact on the team? You have to describe the impact. By that point, the person is going to want to know, what do you want me to do? Like, I, you know, what's next, right? Like, okay, I get it. I get it. Now what? Right. And you have to sort of share some ideas. And then I would six thing, check for understanding or at least start a conversation. So I'm going to give you a, an example. I, this is what happened with my father. So I'll, I'll do one. It'll take 40 seconds. So my father of blessed memory passed away a number of years ago, was blind in one eye and had multiple sclerosis and he was still driving. Okay. So look at the eye. So here we are. I browser. Like, oh. My aunt called his best friend called, you know, people were like, he can't be driving. He's going to hurt somebody. Right. And my brother called me and said, you wrote the book. You talk to him. Okay. So now <laughs> I'm like stuck. Right. So I used my six parts and I want you to listen to me as I go through this, because I literally used my own book. <laughs> dad, Adam and, dad, Adam and I love you. We want you to know that this is that, that this is a difficult conversation, but it's coming from a, a good place. Okay. And we have to talk to you about the fact you're still driving. Annie Marilyn said that you were weaving on the road with her last time she was driving. Uh, Adam found that the, you hadn't turned off the, the stove and it was because you didn't know because you couldn't see that it was still on. And you've asked me a number of times about the digital clock on the oven. You don't know, you know, how to even what the, if it's 450 or whatever, you can't see. And we're worried because of that, that you're gonna hurt somebody or you're gonna hurt yourself. So we need to talk to you about other ways that we, you need to get around because it's just not safe anymore. And so is this a good time or do you wanna just take a, take a break and we'll talk about it tomorrow? And it went on and on. Now, he said to me, go to hell. Okay, that was his immediate response. So fair enough, right? Because what a, just scary. It's scary to be told that you can't do stuff, right? He was defensive. And I said, I understand. And we have some ideas about other ways that you can get transport. So we're going to talk tomorrow or this week. And ultimately he did hurt himself. He, he hit something on the side of the road. And I said, we've had this conversation. And he's like, you're right. You're right. Okay. And that was it. But had I not had the courage to spend that 45 seconds, one, two, three, you know, using it, it was like it was like a scaffold for me. We love you. Here's the topic. Here are the facts. Here's the here's the worry. Here's what we think we need to do. Boom. You can move through the sentences, and they can track your thinking because they don't have a sheet of paper in front of them, right? They're just listening, and so you have to be as clean to me, and as crisp and as humane that as you can be, because they have to follow your thinking. 
You know what I mean? And in moments like that. So in many know, ways, that, that conversation, then if I understand this right, it was almost a clarifying conversation because you, your father's behavior didn't change as a result of it. He had to go out and make the mistake that then yes. brought him back to that. Is that right? That's true. It, it was a clarifying conversation or it was at least a beginning conversation. For me, it was hard because it's hard to tell your father that he needs to stop driving. Yeah. But it was a, it was clarifying, or I guess it was the first hard conversation. Mm -hmm. But I didn't need to have a second hard, hard conversation. And yeah, by the grace good. of God, he just hit himself and he ran into something on the side of the road. I can't even imagine, you know, and that, I'm not alone. I mean, everybody's had, many people have had this conversation, but I had to say what I had to say. Yeah. And what, why, and what, why, why are we so rubbish at hu as humans of, of taking that advice? Why do we still, you know, touch the stove where we shouldn't be touching the stove? You know, what, why, why is your father still driving? When he knows, was, you know, he's, he's got a good idea we shouldn't be. Why can't we listen to that advice and change? Why, why do we have to experience it ourselves? It's a great question. Um, I think it's such a strong need for autonomy and control and uh, feeling personally capable. And when you are told that that is gonna be taken away from you, you've lost your resourcefulness. You've lost your ability to be, to be seen as an adult that is capable in life. And so, it's a very devastating thing. I mean, if somebody said to me, I mean, I have a dear friend who just had a car accident just last week and he now needs physical therapy. He needs occupational therapy. He hit the car was crushed and it's a very humbling experience to be, to not have that you're you just to not be able to do things. And it, it's a very interesting and humbling thing. So that's just, I wonder how that connects with with hard conversations with teachers, but it's that that need for autonomy, that need for cap capacity to know that you're capable of doing something is just such a heavy, important thing. And let's let's bring that back to teachers because yeah. as a profession, we're a judgmental, difficult lot. We um, <laughs> we are, and, and, and we're often rubbish at taking feedback. Absolutely yeah. terrible. We, we sit there with an arrogance and a chip on our shoulders as if to say, well, who's this person that dare tell me something that I've been doing for 12, 20, 30, 40 years? Mm -hmm. why, why, why are we so bad at taking feedback? And, and what can we actually do to be better at being on the receiving end of these difficult conversations? Um, oh, your questions are lovely. And hello. <laughs> uh, I think what's interesting about educators as opposed to um, if we were, uh, we were selling cars, you know, and we didn't sell a car that day and somebody gave us a pointer about that, we wouldn't take it as personally. We are connected, our identity as a teacher, our actions come from, from much closer in. And when we, when we are questioned, when, our, when the, the choice of behavior, for example, in a lesson or whatever, we say, you might've tried this, you might've tried that. It feels so personal as opposed to just looking at, at that behavior at that one moment. And just, it's just, we're, we, we are so tied. It's our identity, our actions and our, everything as a teacher is really close to the bone. And it gets in our way. I know that doctors and pilots and, and other people get coaches and those people give feedback, just like you're in physical education. There are tennis coaches, there are football coaches. Everybody else seems to have a coach. And it never seems, it seems to be just part and parcel of how we roll. We get feedback. It helps us develop. That's how we do. We are always in development. We as teachers, are not developing after we sort of year two. It's just like, we're done, we're done, we're adults, we, we know it. And I think that it's to our detriment, yeah. I think, that we don't know how to take feedback. But it's also, we've had terrible feedback. 
like people have not said it in the in the best way. They haven't provided it in a way that we could listen to it. So it's like it's both sides, but we're not very good at developing. Is it is it going back to your clarifying sort of conversation of actually? Is, sorry, Alan. I, is is it going back to that and actually? making sure that both people involved in the conversation actually understand what feedback is it's not yes. this is right or this is wrong it is actually these are my opinions based on professional expectations experience and you know expectations in the school guidelines values whatever it is and i'm going to give you an opinion and, and some ideas that i thought worked some ideas that i thought maybe could be improved for next time and you do that what you do with that as you, as you wish really Right. And I think that if you said, I'm offering you some ideas, I, I would feel different because I would say that's, that's really interesting, right? You know, thank you for those ideas, those suggestions. I will take those into consideration and make some decisions. I think evalu evaluation and feedback is sort of where we get most of our feedback. And that's, it's such a high stakes thing as opposed to just learning how to give input or give suggestions and using our colleagues as as supports and coaches. I mean, we don't do that enough. I think it's just when we get, how do we get feedback? I think if, for example, you, the three of us, plus a couple other people were in a critical friends protocol, and I threw out, I'm having a really hard time with this kid, and I just don't know what to do, and you gave me ideas, for how I could work more effectively with that, that student, I would feel so good about receiving those ideas. But I also brought the idea, brought the question to the team, and you're giving me support. That's different than when I'm evaluated and somebody says, you should have tried this, you should have done that, you should, 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 should. So I think it's maybe the way we provide input to each other, the situations that might, if we change that, we could be more open to receiving ideas from people. So support versus, sense? yeah, support versus unsolicited advice. Right, right. Or feedback like that's evaluation. Uh, I'm coming back to Lewis's point there about teachers not being great at receiving feedback. And I, I'm going to put a positive spin on it. I, and, and Michael Fullen talks about this, the, the guy from Canada. Talks, yeah. We're so emotionally invested in our work it's a calling. So it, it's, it's right in there. It really hurts. It's almost family-like. Yeah. And, that, and that, that brings those problems with it. And I'm really interested here in, in looking at a few logistics of when you're having, I don't want to call them hard conversations anymore. I'm going to call them what, how you interpret them. They're, we, we have them as, as more constructive. We have them as, as a positive spin on it. We have it as it's that clarifying conversation. I think that's a much a much better term we can put on it. Really nice. Where do you have these? Do you do you bring them into your office? What the location, the body language, the the trigger words? What? How do we do that? How can we make that better? I think it depends. To me, people say, "Well, I want to have it in my office as the administrator, right? Yeah, because man. it's the place where we can be most." Uh, we can have the conversation one on one. There's not a lot of distraction. We can do it there. But that's about power, isn't it? That yes. can have indications of power. Right. So, especially, absolutely. And I have a, I remember a guy, I can't even remember his name anymore. He was in a video that I did where he said, I want to use the power. Like, I think that yeah. there are hard conversations that require that power. So, I'm yeah. going to use, he called it the big desk. <laughs> right. Um, if you come to me and I'm going to sit behind my desk and I'm a principal and I'm going to say this because that'll maybe give you a sense of, oh, this is serious. OK. OK. So that's if you want to do that, that's a very intentional thing. Right. Mm -hmm. If you want to just have a, a conversation that's less about the power, but you really want to respect the person, you might go to their room their classroom, or I had a boss, God love him, he's he's still around. Um, neither of us are at the school, he retired. And he would say, let's take a walk. I kind of want to talk to you about something. And we would walk the football field. This was American football, so the American football, right? So we walked football field. And, and what that did for us is give us a little space right? I wasn't shamed by having to be in his office and people could notice that I was, you know, that, but I would then walk with him. 
less anxiety producing because I'm kind of moving. And we were able, what was interesting, we didn't look at each other. We walked, right? So there was less shame of, hey, you know, like that anger kind of thing. And when he wanted to, he would have that one-on-one -on -one and he would look at me. Do you see what I mean? But he knew, he knew how to manage, should it be two people sitting? Should it be, should there be a desk? Should there be walking? Each one has a different feel to it. I do know in terms of body language that I learned from a colleague, Michael Grinder, what a wonderful colleague who does some nonverbal stuff, that if you really mean something, you put your palms down. You don't put your palms out, but you put your palms out like that wasn't okay. This isn't acceptable. See so, you know what I mean? Your palms are down. And so when you think about classroom management, the same thing is like, come on, guys, everybody needs to have a seat. We need to sit down now. You don't go, can you have a seat, please? Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so your so your body language, and I've taught people are like, this is so important to me. It's really important to you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you look like a wimp. Do not do that. You have to sit up. And you have to go, that wasn't okay. That was really not acceptable. You know what I mean? But you don't have to go like this, but there are just certain pieces that sort of help. And one of them is, is palms down. Like yeah. that's, you know, or, or, you know, like this. So, so, so I, I like the idea of, of the walking and the pausing. And I think that might come back to what Alan mentioned earlier about the idea of power in the desk. It, it does start to create some sort of hierarchy Mm -hmm. in the conversation you're having doesn't it to go from a chat over lunch to a, a walk mm -hmm. to eye contact to an official office scheduled meeting or, or whatever it is that there is some sort of hierarchy there as well isn't there yeah I think there's being mindful of where you're having the conversation and being mindful of your body language is something that most people don't even think about they're like well I don't have time they just need to come to me I'm going to have it here and I'm just going to do it here. And it's like, well, cause that served you, yeah, you know? Yeah. And yet that really wasn't that it causes, I mean, I had a new teacher, somebody said something to her right before she left for the weekend. And she, she threw up all weekend because yeah. the person said I need to talk to you on Monday. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to talk to you about that. What that, that email you get, can you just pop to my office? Can you just come around at the end of the day? And it's from a, from someone who's above you in the hierarchy. Is that a good thing to do? Because the, the manifestation of worry and that yeah. weekend one, can you come and see me on Monday? Oh my gosh. And we can all link with that one, can't we? We've all had an email had like that. I think that if somebody knew that somebody was going to be that anxious and it was manifesting worry, um, they might make a decision to maybe even go down physically look at the person and say, I want to talk to you. Can you pop by later? It do, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. Have a day. And we still need to chat. Right. And so at least you're, you're like, you're, you're courageous. You didn't just like write an email or like do that. But to me, that email is I'm, I had somebody who wrote me, this was so interesting. She sent me feedback on one of the books that I wrote on a Friday to get it out of her email inbox. And she wrote, she wrote me, she goes, here's the last of the feedback on the draft, not great feedback, but let's just not worry about it. And I thought, and so why did you send this to me when you knew it was gonna upset me all weekend? And she, uh, by the next week, I, I didn't even look. I didn't even look at it because I was angry at her choice of timing. And it was my fourth book. I didn't really, you know, and she said to me, you know, that was my bad. I really should have in, I wanted to get it out of my inbox. So I chose to put it in your box just to make, you know, and, and you're right. That probably wasn't very kind. No, yeah. and that's where emails become poisonous, isn't it? Because you can, you can so often, and again, it's something we've all done and we've learned from it, is, is get your thoughts down and you, and it's literally right. That's now empty. It's a it's a right. box checked. It's a job done. I've sent that. Now I don't have to worry about it. And you're not actually taking the time to to think really? of any empathy of how that's received. And I think that that's 
first off, most people in a hard conversation are only worried about themselves. Like, oh my gosh, I have to have this conversation. We're not, we have to stop and say, how can I say it in a humane growth producing way? Mm -hmm. Because I want it, do I want to be effective? I have to think about how I say it and how the other person might be able to hear me. So it's, that's a step that some people haven't, they just want to say it. They're angry. They just want to say it or it has to get off. You know, they have to do it. And it's, um, it's not use, it's not effective. No. You and have I, to I imagine going back to Alan's power comment, there'll be, there'll be some people who will sit there and say, you know, I deliberately send that email because I want that person to be thinking about it for a few days. And I want them to worry a little bit because I want them to come in and, and have, have come in and reflected and thought about maybe why I'm having this conversation with them, because mm. I suppose then that does part of the job for them, doesn't it? I, I guess so. To me, it feels more manipulative than, than helpful. Yeah. Um, and that it's not, I mean, I know people who, well, I thought I'd, I thought I'd talk to you about it on a Friday. So then you can really think more about it over the weekend. And I've had more people say, I actually just thought of all the reasons why the guy was wrong. Then I called all my friends. Now we're <laughs> all angry. Now we're all angry at the guy who did this, you know, as opposed to saying, I want to say this to you on a Tuesday and I, I totally know I'm going to see you for the next three days. And I'm, I'm, I'm an adult and I needed to say this and I'm going to check in with you on Thursday and say, is there anything that's come up that you want to talk about? Was I unclear or did I say something? You know what I mean? Cause I really want you to hear this in the most, you know, the most growth producing way you you really are intending to continue to have a relationship with this person ongoing mm -hmm. my boyfriend and i this is a really interesting thing i just started dating somebody a, about a year and a half ago during covid and both of us are communications consultants and it has to do with hard conversations we decided to do a check-in on sundays okay it's a very short check-in but one of the questions is is there anything that you feel incomplete about that you want to talk about from the last week. Like you always know that you have a place to say something if somebody hurt your feelings or if something wasn't good for the last week. And I'm getting better at hearing that. And sometimes there's nothing. And so when there is something, I hear it, but I want to stay in relationship with them on Monday. So he knows that he's going to say it in a way that I can hear it. And I have to realize that we need to be in it. But it was, it's an interesting question. Is there anything that you feel incomplete about that you'd like to talk about at this time? Anything happen? And I wonder if we did that in, in um, team meetings or whatever, where we gave people a chance to do that, if we would maybe get some people who would be able to be courageous enough to say something as opposed to going into the parking lot and gossiping or going to the pub and whining about, whinging about it, whining about it, you actually address it. And if we did that more often, that might actually be better rather than I have nine things to say to you because I've been upset at you now for seven months. <laughs> it, it takes away that sort of use of bandwidth that sometimes emotional things like that obviously uh, take up, don't they? You know, you spend yeah. so much time worrying about uh, the perceptions of others when you feel like there's something that they're, they're unhappy with. Um, where does honesty fit into all this, Jennifer? Can, is, is honesty always the best policy? Can you be too honest? Yeah, I think that you need to be truthful. I think that you need to be authentic. And there's a way to say things so that you can be effective. So I, I, my friend Edmundo Norte, a colleague of mine who was so influential to me, do you want to be right or effective? And so you could be honest and tell the truth and be right, but would that be helpful? So the question is, how can you say it in a way that would really be effective, that you can be heard? I don't want you to lie. I think you'll start getting an ulcer if you don't live in integrity with yourself. But there is a way to say things so that 
you don't get an ulcer and the other person can hear it. So is there something as too much honesty? I guess I would, I would say it in a different way. I think there are ways you can be honest, but not be hurtful. It's another speed bump, isn't it? I like that question. Is yeah. it, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? Right. And then stop. So if you want to be effective, which doesn't say that you are not truthful, doesn't mm. say that you're not authentic, doesn't say that you have to lie, doesn't say that you have to, it just says, how might you say it so that you could say it in a way other people could hear it. And uh, most so people, yeah. I think linked into that, I know we've talked about this again previously on, on different guests is, do we have to win every time? Do we have to actually win as a, as a leader or do you just sometimes have to say, look, this is not the time really. I'm gonna, just gonna take, as you've talked about, a step back and maybe the winning is not everything. It's just an honourable draw sometimes, or you might even lose. Right. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> right. I think you have to decide what you're going to absolutely speak up about. You have to yeah. know what your non-negotiables are. You have to, yeah. to me, if, if, I, if I saw a teacher teaching two plus two is 12, I would say something. If I saw a kid running into a street, I would say something. If I saw that somebody was really hurtful, I would say something. If it didn't, you know, if it wasn't the exact right style of teaching that I loved, but it was not terrible, do you really need to go there? If somebody really wasn't harmed by something, even though you said something socially awkward, but it wasn't too painful, do you really need to say something? Um, you have to decide what's worth kind of saying something around. And I've had in the last number of weeks, um, interactions with people where people were incensed about things. And I apologized. And somebody goes, well, that was very nice of you. And I said, what, you know, whatever, like, do I want to be right or effective? Did I need to apologize? Not really. W would it be useful? So the other person and I have a better relationship? Absolutely. And, so I'm like, I, that, that's me getting older yeah, too. Yeah. I was yeah. not like that 20 years ago. But, but also the, the, there's, there's a distinct sort of pop, popping your ego down there, isn't there? And, and just stepping away from it. And it brings us right back around to those three things that you use right at the beginning of our conversation about a, qualify, a qualification criteria. Is this conversation worth having if it's educationally unsound, physically unsafe or emotionally damaging? Then it is. And I think that qualifying criteria is going to be picking up on some of the, the, the things you talked about, very contextualized as well for each person, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and what your values are and did somebody step over? And if that was something that you cannot stand, you need to speak up and you have to speak up in a way that somebody can hear that you were extremely offended or that that was very hurtful to you. And, and, and now what should they do differently? And I, you cannot say, well, you're an adult, do it, you know, just learn for yourself. You know, that ends up being sort of immature too. You have to be in a it, we're in the education we need to do this in a forward thinking growth producing way so yeah very good we, we're going to wind it down now jennifer and we, we like to have a little bit of fun to oh, finish please. up on <laughs> yeah. um our favorite one jennifer three three leaders dead or alive from 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 the past from the present who you would love to, uh, to spend an evening with and have a good chat I think both the Roosevelts, uh, the president, Franklin Delano, and his wife, Eleanor. And just recently, I've been thinking about Golda Meir. I'm just thinking of some really strong women um, that I would love to, to meet. Um, and I'm sure that's that great. there are others, but that sounds good. That yeah. could be a really interesting It dinner. sounds like someone's asked you that before. You reeled them off pretty sharp. I know, that was fast. Would would they be would they be clarifying conversations there? Or is it just good old chat? <laughs> I think we could chat. In fact, let's add Winston. Let's add Winston Churchill to it. I, oh, I, I'm, yeah, you know, yeah, arguments. Get him in. <laughs> Get him in. Because then we'd have, yeah, there would be three women, two men. I suppose we'd have to add somebody else to it if we want a proper dinner or whatever. But who cares? <laughs> no. Somebody else can have to cook. Jennifer, if you hide a billboard at the side of a busy, um, I'm going to say motorway, but that's that's not the American term, is it? Freeway at the side of a, a very busy freeway. What would your billboard say? Um, I always think that my my billboard or my thing is find your voice around what matters. 
but I wonder if given what's that we have so much, so many challenges right now in the United States with um, people uh, being asked to sort of not share the truth. There's a lot of uh, critical race theory debates and things. I, I would say, I would say something like step up, speak up, show up, step up, speak up. I think maybe that you have to say something. If you see something that's wrong, you have to say something. You have to not let it go. Which could probably be a bystander. Which could probably th throw us off into another enthralling conversation for quite a while. <laughs> but um, Jennifer, thank you so much for, for spending your time with us. I know that the time's getting on on a Friday night in California, what a wonderful part of the world it is. Uh, before we do say goodbye, tell us a little bit about where our listeners can find out more about you, about your books, and about the wonderful work that you do. I have a website, which is jenniferabrams.com, just my name. Um, they can write me at jennifer at jenniferabrams.com. They can find me on Twitter at Jennifer Abrams. I try to keep it pretty consistent. Um, my books are with three different publishers, um, but you can find all of that on the website, having hard conversations all the way down to the newest book uh, called St Stretching Your Learning Edges, Growing Up at Work. And that I would definitely love to talk to you guys about at another time, because um, I think we do need to be developing ourselves to be better educators and bigger human beings. So that's where the book comes in. Well, Jennifer, let's get that in the diary. Stepping up at work and be the next theme we, we have a conversation. I've thoroughly right. enjoyed today. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. You. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Jennifer. Take care.